everyone, and welcome to our first episode of Product Talks, where we talk about skincare products, ingredients, and formulations. I'm Dr. Leslie Bauman, dermatologist, author, and researcher, and I have a passion for skincare. And I'm going to be interviewing experts from around the world about their skincare technologies. Um, today, we're going to be talking about exosomes that are found in a new skincare brand called Plated Skin Science by a company called Rion. I am not, this is not a paid sponsorship. I've received no money to do this podcast and I am not working or, or for this company at all. Um, I saw the technology and invited the, the doctors to be here on the show. And I'm very excited that they took the time out of their busy days because they're both doctors seeing patients to come talk about exosome technology. I am excited to introduce our two new distinguished guests today. Rion co-founder, CEO, and heart transplant cardiologist, Dr. Ata Befar and dermatologist and cellular senescence researcher, Dr. Saranya Wiles. She's the chief investigator for the plated clinical trials. I am so excited to have you both here. So we're going to be talking about a new brand called Plated Skin Science that uses the technology of exosomes. And um, I am such a science nerd, and I'm very interested in cellular senescence. And I've been trying to get these two on a call to discuss this for a while. So I'm so happy that you get to hear what they have to say. So, Dr. Bethfar, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in this, because you're a cardiologist, right? I am a cardiologist. Uh, thanks so much for having us. We're very excited to be here. So, my background is uh, in regenerative medicine. I've been doing stem cell research for the past 20 years at the Mayo Clinic, and I specialize in heart transplant, which if you think about it, is the ultimate manifestation of regeneration, right? We're replacing the entire organ. But the goal of our program has always been to avoid transplant and to try to find different molecules that can maybe restore normal tissue function. And as we worked on stem cells for a long period of time, what we ultimately discovered was that in our bodies live these small molecules called exosomes that foster tissue healing. So in all of you right now, you have these small molecules that come from your platelets, and every time you injure your tissues, these molecules help your tissues normally heal. But in aging or in chronic disease, these molecules start to become deficient. In other words, some tissues just don't see them. And the skin is being the largest organ of the body, as I'm learning here from my colleagues, is really the organ that's most susceptible to aging because it loses its blood vessels. And so as these platelets normally in young people penetrate the tissue and are able to deliver these regenerative cues, as we age and as these zombie cells in, in the tissue start to become pervasive, they can't penetrate the tissue anymore, and so you can't mount a regenerative response. And so what we're working on now is to develop exosomes that can actually penetrate your skin and can deliver these regenerative cues to the reverse the process of aging. That is so interesting. I've always loved looking at the cardiology literature because a lot of the anti-aging things come from you all first, and this is another example. Um, and then Dr. Wiles is a dermatologist. How did you end up working with Dr. Bayfar on this project? Yeah, this is an exciting story. So I'm a dermatologist at Mayo Clinic. I actually came to Mayo Clinic about 11 years ago uh, from New York to do my MD-PhD program. And I started out thinking that I was going to be a cardiologist, which is how I met um, the co-founders of Rian, uh, Dr. Befar and Dr. Terzik. And really, it's been amazing to see the research evolve over the last uh, over a decade. You know, 15 years of research has gone into this science that we're talking talking about. Um, so my PhD focused on regenerative medicine principles. I went on to uh, become a dermatologist and I have a lab studying different models of skin aging. Uh, we're studying hallmarks of aging, including cellular senescence. We're 3D bioprinting skin, making different aged skin models to see how we can test these exosomes and other products for better drug delivery and product delivery to the skin. So that's essentially how 
I connected with Dr. Bafar, and uh, it's been an exciting journey since then. Well, you were the perfect person you needed for this research because your background is right on it. I didn't even know there was a regenerative medicine specialty, so that's great to know. Um, so I write a column every month for the last 20 years for dermatologists, and every month I talk about a different cosmetic ingredient. And the thing that is driving me nuts over the last couple of years is there just isn't anything new. You know, we have retinoids and antioxidants, and we're learning more about inflammation. But when I was introduced to Dr. Befar, I was so excited because this is actually something new. Um, and by the way, I am not a fan of stem cells and skincare products because we know they don't live in, in the shelf space. And, and they're usually Apple stem cells, not even human stem cells anyway. So I've always been annoyed with all these companies that have stem cells in their, in their products. But you have something that stem cells secrete. So you figured out how to get around having to have stem cells in the product but having the same results. So I'm excited because this is something that actually works. Um, the other thing that bothers me um, is pseudoscience, and, and I want to make sure we explain to our listeners the science of this so they don't get tricked by the pseudoscience. And one, one example of that is um, sirtuins, as you know, are a protein that gets turned on when, um, when you're younger, and when you get older, it gets turned off. So when that data first came out about 10 years ago, a lot of companies started putting sirtuin on their product label. So when you would shop for skincare, you'd buy something with sirtuin, which is ridiculous because that can't get in the skin and do anything. So I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of companies out there saying they have exosomes, but they're not really exosomes. So tell me a little bit about how, how can people know what's a real exosome and what's kind of a pseudo exosome? So I think that there are several elements uh, in play when we think about exosomes. Uh, the first thing to remember is that if you want an exosome that just achieves regeneration, you can't really get that from a tissue, right? A tissue has thousands of different types of cells. And you can't expect that every one of those different types of cells is going to secrete a regenerative exosome. And so when you hear that I have placental tissue-derived exosomes or I have, uh, you know, this type of tissue or that type of fluid-derived exosome, there, there isn't a uniform product in there. It's just the diversity of exosomes that could be inflammatory, cytotoxic, meaning it's toxic to your cells. And so you're not going to get a product that will drive tissue healing in a uniform and standard and reproducible way. The other thing to remember about exosomes is that they're very stable. Think about them in your body. When your cells shed them, they're expected to sort of stick around, right, to deliver the message to other tissues in the body, which means they should be able to survive your body temperature, which is 98, right, Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius. So why is it that the products that we're seeing are frozen, you know, at minus 80 degrees Celsius? Something must be wrong, right? The exosomes must be broken, or they must have been processed in a way that disrupts their really unique shell that preserves their, their function. So an exosome that is functional, purified in the correct way, needs to come from a single source of regenerative cells and really should be rendered in a way that keeps it room temperature stable. I think those are really two hallmark things to look at. The ones I'm seeing on the market claim that they're from placenta or amniotic fluid or, um, or fat cells. So what you're saying is those are going to have all different kinds of exosomes that don't necessarily do what we want it to do. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's exactly right. Just think about, just imagine getting placenta or getting amniotic fluid or getting fat tissue. What does that look like in your own mind? right? It's not a pure process, and it's sort of a pretty arduous medical type of event and an arduous laboratory event. What tissues are you playing with? What cells are you deriving and working with 
to get that final product. What we focused on is really to have a purified source and our ultimate decision based on the data was to go with platelets, right? Think about what's the first responder in your body when you cut yourself, right? You cut yourself, you look down, oh, I cut myself, I'm bleeding. What's the cell that's there first? It's your platelets, right? So your body uses platelets to heal. We're leveraging those cells to purify the messages from the platelets to help your tissues regenerate in the same way. Um, because just for the viewers, when you heal, you have to make more collagen, which is the same thing you want to do when you're getting rid of wrinkles is making more collagen. So while this would make you heal faster, it would also help rejuvenate your skin. Is that right? That's exactly right. Yeah. So the platelet regenerative exosomes drive several processes in your skin, which includes collagen formation, which includes elastin formation. And indeed, uh, Serenia's work has really documented uh, true uh, skin uh, beauty benefits with continuous application of these uh, uh, of this technology, which is in the peer-reviewed literature. So, Dr. Wells, that brings me to a question. Is this like PRP? It sounds almost like a plat uh, platelet-rich plasma that we use after microneedling or something in the clinic. Is, uh, is it similar? So PRP is really the flagship technology you can think of that introduced us to the idea that platelets could play a role in skin rejuvenation, hair restoration, but PRP is highly variable. So it varies between patients and even among patients. Um, things like the meal that you had the night before can change your plasma levels um, and your platelet levels and your platelet health. So there's a lot of variability. This is why going with a pooled platelet population and an allogeneic product or a product that's from a group of people, um, exot, not from the individual themselves, actually neutralizes that risk, that variability. And it allows us to collect a population that is more consistent and, and beyond platelets, it's how they're working. It's their exosomes. Um, so I think by collecting their messages, we're actually able to enhance the effects with PRP that we've seen to be really beneficial in some, um, but now making it accessible to more people. So I keep hearing you say the way that you get the exosomes out and purify them is so important. Tell us a little bit more about how you get your exosomes out of the platelets um, in your product and what's unique about that. So there's a lot of different techniques to isolate exosomes. Typically what's done is the process called ultra centrifugation or high speed spinning. Um, so it's kind of like what Dr. Bafar refers to when the NASA explorers go in those high G4 spinners and you kind of see their faces go back. So it's, it's exactly like that. They're very highly spun. So you also have to be careful because they can be fragile and, and break during that spinning process. Um, so the, we've come up with a patented process that actually um, stabilizes that exosome shell and keeps it protected and make sure that they're not ruptured um, so that you can kind of continue to keep that message intact. So really asking about how the exosome product is manufactured and looking at those details does matter. So these exosomes, are they have two lipid membrane layers, kind of like your cell membranes, and those surround, they're like a sphere, and inside it has all the good stuff that makes all the collagen grow and, and get sort of inflammation. So what you're saying is you have to spin them properly so they don't break open and lose all their contents and lose all their activity. Um, exactly. And then, okay, I understand. So... Um, because that's what's so special about exosomes, right, is they can carry RNA and things that um, wouldn't normally be able to exist or live outside of this protective sphere. So that's, that's my understanding of what's so wonderful about exosomes. Is there a way a cell can talk to another cell very clearly using a different language than it can with growth factors or something like that because it can do RNA and, and more precise signaling? Exactly. I kind of think about exosomes as the full message. So you have growth factors and uh, different products that are partial messages. Maybe they're letters or words, but exosomes is a full sentence where you have the full recipe to regenerate. Right. 
And, you know, with growth factor creams, sometimes you'll have a cream that has one growth factor in it, like TGF beta, or you'll have another cream that has hundreds of different growth factors and we don't know what they are. That kind of is parallel to what you said about the exosome. Some creams may have all kinds of different ones and yours is more purified from platelets. So I think it's the same idea as you need to know what you're putting on your skin. And the only way you can know is by how it is produced. It needs to be produced properly and you need to be able to get the right exosomes out. Um, exactly. And then, so I, I realized that your, your brand is called Plated, which sounds like platelets. What well, that makes it very easy to remember. I like that. What a great name. Okay, let's see. Um, let's have, I have a list of questions here for you because I don't want to forget anything. Tell me a little bit about how you're using the plated product in your aesthetic practice in Rochester. Yeah, so we love the platelet product um, at the Mayo Clinic Center on aesthetic medicine and surgery. We actually have it in retail there, um, and I use it in two different ways. So one is I use it for skin health improvement. So I have patients that come in with a significant sun damaged skin or just um, skin that needs improvement in general, um, just to get it to the right level. We kind of think about the different levels of skin aging and really that epidermis or the top layer and getting it to the right proper skin health stage will really help all the other layers. So before we think about a neurotoxin, a filler, a laser procedure, really optimizing that top epidermal skin health is high priority. So if I see patients that come in with um, significant skin damage, I use the product uh, for four to six weeks. And this is what our trial has actually shown. You get uh, that induction, really nice response and benefit uh, within that four to six week time. And so that's the plated gold product. And then I switch them over to the plated silver product as a maintenance product, which continues to keep their benefit. And in, in the studies that we've done, it actually has shown sustained results for up to six months. Um, so really nice results that way. The second way that I use it is post uh, laser recovery. So oftentimes after CO2 uh, or even Fraxel, we can apply it right away. It I find that it, it adds as an adjuvant to improve that response in regeneration that they're gonna get, that collagen boost that they're gonna get from their laser procedure. And it also improves that skin healing uh, at a recovery uh, period as well. So um, it's a really nice combination. You can layer it right away. Um, some patients even use it as a primer before the laser, so they really optimize their skin before having a procedure. So it works great in those two specific ways, and we're doing more studies to find other indications for it. I've been using it in my practice as well, the same way that you are, but I'm also treating people with rosacea and other inflammatory skin diseases because of the data that you've shown that it gets rid of some redness. And um, I like to use it after procedures such as Ulthera for skin tightening because I believe it's going to – anything that you're doing to somebody to try to get them to make more collagen, whether it's microneedling or Ulthera or radiofrequency, um, I believe it works better. When I had Ulthera, I used it, and I got great results. And I, I think – I mean, it, it, maybe I would have gotten great results anyway, but I don't think so because I've had Ulthera before. And when I did it this time with the plated product, I, I really saw a lot of tightening. The other thing I'm using it for um, are pimples. Like if somebody has an acne pimple or a, cold, a herpes cold sore or something that you want to hurry and get rid of, um, it makes it go away faster. Does that make sense? Am I imagining that or would that make sense to you? Dr. Bauman, you're touching on all the things that we are excited about this technology, and we're actually in the works of developing a medical dermatology product, um, doing a lot of FDA IND-based studies um, that make sure that we're under the proper regulations to address some of these different medical indications. I think the technology allows a lot of these different um, applications to be plausible, and Dr. Bafar, I'll turn it over to him to highlight some of the medical indications that we're pursuing that's in alignment with some of the conditions like rosacea and other inflammatory um, process that, that you're talking about. And before you say something, I want to say, I meant to say at the beginning, um, I don't have, this was not a sponsored um, podcast or video, and I am not financially related to the company at all. So um, I may talk about things that normally they're not supposed to say, um, but I'm just telling you about my experience in my clinic. So I think. Um from my perspective, uh, there are a lot of potential therapeutic implications for purified uh, 
platelet exosomes that are uh, manufactured under CGMP, you know, uh, and as Serenia mentioned, go through the FDA process. I can tell you a little bit about our experiences with that as it relates to both antiviral activity as well as wound healing. So very interestingly, and again, think about how platelets work in your body naturally, right? So one of the things that would seem relatively obvious is if you have a wound, there would be something in your body that protects your body against things like viruses. And indeed, what we found is that platelet-derived exosomes cope viruses. They actually completely encapsulate different forms of viruses, bind their uh, envelope, and um, neutralize them. So one of my graduate students, that's her entire PhD thesis, it's just on looking at that. So the experiential findings uh, that maybe they help with things like cold sore would make sense uh, based on that type of work. Um, as it relates to acne, especially the wound that's associated with acne, uh, when we look at platelet-derived exosomes, they are a wound healing technology, right? They evolve to be wound healing tools in the body. And so indeed on the uh, the medical grade product, which is called PEP, um, we are deploying platelet exosomes to accelerate wound healing. And indeed, have, uh, are just finishing the phase one trial for wound healing and are about to start a, um, a, the next phase of multi center evaluation, looking at, um, uh, different applications for, uh, wound healing, especially in recalcitrant wounds, in other words, wounds that are very difficult to heal. I looked through the dermatology literature, and there is a, there are a lot of great studies to show that exosomes help with wound healing. So that's pretty recognized in the dermatology world. Uh, but what's new, I think, about your product is that it's for aging. This is the first exosome product I've seen that gets rid of fine lines and wrinkles. And what I've seen with my patients is they... Um, they really need to use it six, I feel like six to eight weeks. But my patients are really picky. They want no line. So maybe that's why. But what we think, I tell them, don't use it for a week and give up. You need to use it, get, you know, get some time under your belt. And I'd love to hear more about what you saw in the trials. Um, but they do notice the tightening right away and they like the texture of it. But the actual small fine lines and the, and the improvement of redness does take a little bit to kick in. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you saw in the trial and, and if I'm right about that. Yeah, absolutely. So what we saw in the trial is exactly similar to what your patients are experiencing four to six weeks for that skin health induction. So to see that initial improvement in redness, restoration in some of their fine lines, wrinkles, even as early as six weeks, which we typically expect with three months or continued application for several months to see that change. Um, and then we also saw improvement in brown spots or pigmentation. We used a very exciting technology with Canfield Vizia a CR, um, 3D Primos, to be able to measure some of these fine lines and deeper wrinkles. And we came up with a skin comprehensive skin score that's basically using this regenerative aesthetic scoring system for, for the face facial aging. And that allowed us to look at all these different factors, redness, wrinkles, brown spots, color evenness, luminosity, put it all together and see how these different parameters that work different and everybody had a different response, meaning some people had more improvement in one factor over the other, um, which is where they needed it. So it kind of is an individualized um product in that regard. So it really, this comprehensive skin score allowed us to see that it really had an improvement within that six week time frame. And then when we followed them up to six months, they continued to maintain that level. Um, what I also see is that the product um, can be used you know, once or twice a day. So depending on how the patients are using it and um, how well it's being applied and, and things like that. So you really want to put the product on, wait for five to 10 minutes before layering another product. Um, so that, that was an important aspect in the study that we wanted to take away for the patients as well. 
I've been having my patients use it prior to a retinoid at night because I'm such a big retinoid fan. So I have them put it on, wait a few minutes, and then put retinol or tazeratine or tretinoin or, or one of the retinoids on top. And what I've noticed is they seem to be able to tolerate the retinoid better. They get less redness from the retinoid, which makes sense because you have some anti-inflammatory factors that are in there. So I can't wait till you all do a study in the future, hopefully, on retinoids and your product together because I think using these in combination would be great. Um, and that's the thing is there's so many different anti-aging creams out there and serums that people just don't know which ones to use. So my recommendation would be that they do um, a vitamin C serum, wait, and then put yours on on top of it. And then at night, put your, the plate it on and then put a retinoid. Um, is there a problem with those recommendations at all? Uh, will it, would it be okay to put vitamin C and wait and then put your product on top? So this product is actually creating a new disruptive category within the skincare market, which is um, sort of the Swiss army knife, one size fits all kind of the tool, a tool that does multiple things. Um, so for instance, if we look at a vitamin C, an antioxidant product also has some benefit with collagen synthesis. So if we look at a product like that and compare it with the plated exosomes, we've actually shown in our medical grade product that the antioxidant factors and, and the, the fact that it can regulate superoxide, dismutase, catalase, and directly target them is actually occurring directly compared to the vitamin C pathway. So you actually have a higher quenching of these reactive oxygen species or a better, more direct approach to getting that antioxidant effect through the plated product. So in some ways, using a vitamin C may be redundant because the plated is doing that factor for you. Uh, I understand people love their skincare regimen, so I don't disrupt a routine. If they prefer to keep their vitamin C, this is a great way to do it. I always say put the plated on first after a cleanser and leaving giving it enough time um, so that you can moisturize or layer on top with other products. So from my perspective, um, what the product creates is a potentially unique synergistic opportunity. Because this product is offering the same types of events that you're achieving with vitamin C and with retinols, but through a new mechanism. Meaning that if you want to achieve maximal antioxidant effect, vitamin C gets rid of free radicals outside of cells. This product gets rid of them inside of cells. Right? So you have a one-two punch potentially when you pair the two together. Retinols help cell turnover using a different pathway than exosome that also facilitates cell turnover. And you're right, you get this potential tolerizing effect uh, with exosomal application. So it does appear that there may be this opportunity with this unique new product to almost supercharge your vitamin C application, as well as your retinol application by adding this element to those other regimens. So uh, indeed, it may may not be a bad idea to do so, at least from, I'm not a dermatologist, but um, but at least from a scientific perspective, it seems like it would make sense. Well, I know you need ascorbic acid, vitamin C to make collagen. So my thoughts were, if you're revving up collagen production, it, your body might need more vitamin C to help help make that collagen. That's what I was thinking. That mechanism does make sense. I think that's a good point. Okay. Is there anything you can't mix it with? And I know exosomes are very stable, and your product in particular has really good shelf life, but is there anything we shouldn't put it together with on the skin? Like what about hydroxy acids and things like that? So I was just going to say that, from our studies so far, um, you know, we see that the topical product alone works really well. So we kind of have the product drive the skin science. Um, so really adding it individually. I would say if we're considering mixing products, it's just the, it, the time, you know, so applying the product first as the raw ingredient with the plated exosomes, because certain other factors, if you were to directly mix it, may inactivate or may not work together with the product as well. So putting on the product first and then layering is a, an option that can still work. And we'd love to do that Retin-A study with you oh, so that, that we can see the effect. 
Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, so you talked at the beginning about cellular senescence, and we know that older skin has these senescent cells, and, and like you said, the bad apple that makes all the apples bad. Have you looked at cellular senescence with your product? Does it affect that at all? So cellular senescence um, can is a factor that does accrue with aging. Um, and epidermal, so there's different layers of senescence. So you can have epidermal senescence, which is a top layer, and then dermal senescence, which is really where fibroblasts can become senescent and the different that's how different collagen is not produced as well. Um, so in terms of the factors, we're doing the medical grade studies to see how it's affecting the cell senescence, but the preclinical studies are showing that it is helping um, in that regard, especially with that senescent fibroblast population um, and, and potentially kind of helping it's the concept of how regenerative medicine and longevity kind of go hand in hand. Um, it's if you have the aging process where these cells are kind of declining in function, the regenerative process brings that function back, right? It's that restoring the form and function idea. So as we age, we lose that natural regenerative capacity. So by adding these factors like exosomes, we're kind of fueling the body to be able to start the engine again and be able to make new collagen and other factors that bring us healthy aging. So um, these are definitely things that we're looking at, um, and we will be looking forward to telling you that what that shine, science shows. It really sounds like the panacea for aging. Uh, it's really amazing, and at all the dermatology conferences, I hear people talking excitedly about exosomes. Why did it take the world so long to discover them? Because we heard, I know we thought for years stem cells were making all these positive changes, and now we, we know it isn't the stem cells, it's actually the exosomes the stem cells are making. But, um, that you know, I didn't start hearing about exosomes till about a year ago. Why were they so hard to discover? So uh, our focus, you know, initially when the field of regenerative medicine really got revved up, uh, even uh, until when Serenia was with us as a PhD student, um, was really that stem cells maybe serve as brick and mortar for tissue. And, and the whole focus was on the cell needing to remain intact to achieve true regenerative events. Until a paper that was published by Victor Zhao, um, probably around 2005 or six in Nature Medicine, he activated a protein inside stem cells called AKT. And with that activation, collected the medium from these stem cells and showed that the medium was working just as well as the stem cells, which sort of blew the whole field apart, right? Because now you suddenly realize maybe it's not the brick and mortar, it's something else. We thought, as did everybody else, that it was release of growth factors. Well, as it turns out, the field of growth factor biology really is stealing all of its data from the hemonc field and immunology. Cytokines are released naked. Growth factors aren't often released naked. They're in exosomes, right? And so although we were hunting down growth factors, we were just missing that they're being packaged. And as we're doing our Western blots and all these other scientific studies, we're disrupting the exosomes every time. For us, it was only until we started to do stem, big stem cell clinical trials and heart failure, and then took those stem cells that performed well and didn't perform well, brought them back to the lab, and started to look very carefully at different cellular compartments and secreted compartments, that we suddenly realized, oh wait, if it was a growth factor, it would be tiny. The things that are creating this magic are huge, right? Huge compared to growth factors. And ultimately, using things like electron microscopy, we started to see these little balls everywhere, right? And once we had that, and you know, you go back to the literature and you realize, oh, these are called exosomes. But exosomes were described first in the 1960s uh, it's just that it took science this step-by-step -step process to whittle down to the point where now we finally have the active ingredient of regeneration. 
and we know how to get it out safely and put it in a jar <laughs> or exactly. a airless pump. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so is it, do you think that this technology is going to make growth factor creams obsolete? Because I um, imagine that the growth factors are not as stable in the, in the serums and the gels as the exosomes are. Yeah, I do think that that is a possibility because you essentially want to have um, a, a, a product that is encompassing of all messages. So if you think about the platelet secretome uh, that's kind of contained within the exosome, it's got thousands of pro proteins and growth factors and um, all these different factors that are contained within that versus having just one or two or three. Um, in fact, we may be doing more harm than good by having just isolated one or two or three growth factors compared to a pooled population that's more natural to how the body would respond. So I think that's where there's going to be a shift in kind of focusing on one ingredient to more a holistic approach, kind of thinking about the full message and, and how that can be incorporated into skincare products. I always explain to my patients when I'm trying to tell them that, that it's like a football team. You know, you need a quarterback and you need your receivers and you need the safeties. You need all the different players playing or you can't win the game. And if you just have one growth factor, it's like just having a quarterback with nothing else. And it um, sounds like exosomes kind of have the whole team inside of them and that that's why you've seen such success with this product. That's right. Okay, sorry about the football analogy, but I'm from Texas. So. <laughs> love, love the football analogy. Perfect timing. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you about that you want to tell us about or any kind of other science that we didn't talk about? I think from from my perspective, the thing to just uh, realize about naturally occurring exosomes, again, if they're purified from a single source, is that in contrast to individual growth factors that are essentially have to be manufactured, these products are uh, essentially have evolved over a billion years, right? They, they are designed by trial and error over many, many, many years to do what they do in, the exact, in a very exacting way. It's impossible to synthesize that. Um, and I think that naturally occurring exosomes uh, are very well suited Fill all of the gaps that are needed to achieve uh, uh, this type of uh, regenerative event uh, as, as we as we see it in soft tissue. So I think that's what's really unique about this field and the science is that we can actually learn from the polyvalency, if you will, which means one thing doing many things uh, of exosomes, not just in the way that we're talking about, but also in actually understanding the biology behind these events, these anti-aging events or soft tissue healing events. And so I think what we're focused on now in the laboratory is to look at each of these molecular pathways and understand why is it that you're getting these unique biological events with exosomes like platelet-derived exosomes uh, and, and I think it's going to really shed a lot of light on how our body works. Uh, it's just a very exciting time in regimen. I think it is, too. And I think you're probably going to see people using this after microneedling um, because it makes sense you would heal faster and get a better result after microneedling and after all kinds of procedures. So as now, this the product is new on the market, and so you're – if, um, if the viewers go ask their dermatologist, their dermatologist might not even have heard about this yet. It's so new. It's only available with some of the top dermatologists right now, but pretty soon, um, because I, I know you, it's hard to manufacture a lot of it in the beginning, so it's not as easy to get, right? So that's why it's about almost $250 a bottle, but it's one of the times that it's worth it. I'm a big believer in you need to know when to splurge and when to save, and this is a time when it's worth it to splurge, and plus it's one product doing the same as 
three other products. So in the long run, it ends up being cheaper. But my fear is that people are going to get tricked into buying these other products that say exosome on the label and spend, I would hate for them to spend $250 on something that isn't this product and isn't going to work. So how do they know? What do they look for on the label? Or, or if they see exosome, what's the question that we ask the drug reps so that we know uh, you're obviously both the real deal and your work was done at Mayo and you have all these great publications, but you know copycats are going to come along. So what do we ask them and how do we figure out if their product is good or not? Perfect. So I, I think that's a very important question. Um, the first thing I would say is exosome source is very important to distinguish. So uh, making sure it's, you know, a if it's a plant stem cell or a plant-based exosome, um, you know, those are not com biocompatible with human cells and they will not be able to work as well or at all. So I would just be very cautious about those types of products. Um, the other source I'd, you know, just w talk about or at least have the audience ask companies about is stem cell based exosomes. So if we think about how it's being manufactured or done, we get a stem cells from a fat biopsy um, or umbilical cords from one or two patients, and then they're grown in a laboratory over and over and over again for multiple rounds. So, you know, we talked about cellular senescence before, and that's actually a concept that can happen um, if you take something that's natural within our bodies and then grow them in a laboratory for multiple weeks. Um, so stem cell based products, while they sound very exciting, it's the buzzword, it's the stem cell factor that's exciting. If you think about how it's manufactured, it's actually in a lab for multiple weeks and not even in the body. So you want to be cautious of how those are um, brought to market and and thinking about, you know, they're they're refrigerated. And as Dr. Bufar mentioned, they're kind of ha have different storage um, stability concerns that may go along with it. So you really want to ask them about how it's manufactured, where it's coming from. Um, is it shelf stable? Uh, those are all great questions to start for an exosome product. And there's actually not many um, shelf stable exosome product. I believe we're the first and only and I'll have Dr. Bufar verify that. So I think um, just to build on what Serena said, we have a paper in cell transplants that came out over a decade ago where we actually show that if you passage a stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell, 20 uh, for 20 population doublings, right? That means one or two passages, you get catastrophic chromosomal mutation. Right, so, so you can look up the the paper, but essentially we colored the chromosomes and show they're all jumbled up within 20 population doublings, right? So that's like two, three passages. So their behavior in a petri dish is just going to become bizarre, and so we're not sure what kinds of output they have thereafter. So I think that's been a, a that's been a concern. Uh, with using these uh, cultured master cell banks to produce exosomes. The other element here is that really when exosomes are offered right now, you have to remember that a cosmetic exosome is topically applied. It's not an injectable, right? This isn't a medicine. It's a cosmetic. Uh, so... You should not accept any exosome that's an injectable. Um, we have medicinal exosomes in trials right now, but none are approved by the FDA for use. So this is only for cosmetic application. And an exosome, if delivered once, right, you have a single application of an exosome. It's like me quickly reading three pages of a novel to you and then that's it. How much of that is your skin going to remember? Zero. Maybe a few words, right? You need exosomes to be there on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis to inform tissues to, um, to have this cosmetic event. So um, a one-and-done exosome isn't really very meaningful. You need to have this type of uh, application for cosmetic applications really on a day-to-day -day basis to truly see the beauty benefits of exosomes.
Yeah, the way I explain it to my patients is if you're trying to lose weight and you go to a health spa for a week and then you eat wrong and don't exercise the whole rest of the year, it's not going to work. But if you eat right and exercise every day, it's that consistency. So same thing with the exosomes. They need to be there and be prodding your fibroblasts, make collagen, make collagen, make collagen all the time so they, so they, so they, don't, they don't get lazy. Because when we get older, our cells get lazy, so they need this, this prompt. I was just going to say, and that was actually one of the exciting things that we found in our study, was that age did not factor into how well patients responded. So we had patients from 40 years old to 80 years old, and they had beautiful response um, and really nice improvement in collagen. So any, it's never too late. And it can even be preventative, too. By stopping the inflammation and getting rid of senescent cells, it should prevent aging. Exactly, and we're, that's why we're excited about the prejuvenation concept, too. So I think that earlier age group is, um, is, is a wonderful place to start and kind of get ahead with that um, senescence buildup. Well, great. Well, that wraps up the episode of Product Talks. We're almost out of time. Thank you both so much for joining us. Um, if the viewers have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. I'm going to put a link to your study down there, although it's copyrighted, so they won't be able to get the whole study, but at least they can read the abstract on PubMed and see the great work that you've done. And um, thank you so much for going and, and doing a study and proving what you say, because it's so annoying when companies make all these claims and they don't back it up. It's nice that, um, that you have the science. So thank you both. I know you're so busy, and I know you have to get back to seeing patients. So thank you so much for being on the show. That wraps up our episode of Product Talks. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Bayfar and Dr. Wiles, for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us. Make sure to leave any comments down below. I will put a link to the paper and the research studies that go along with this product. Let me know in the comments if you have any ideas for future episodes or things that you want to learn. And um, if you enjoyed this video, please give us a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you for episode number two. I'm already working on who our speakers are going to be.